Good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate you uh, taking time to be a part of our digital summer series. It's almost over. Uh, we've got two more weeks after this one. And then as long as everything goes as planned, we're going to begin to start meeting at the church building uh, for some socially distanced uh, Bible classes. Uh, tonight, we look forward to hearing from Ricky Collum. Uh, Ricky is the minister for the Hackleburg Congregation. I uh, love Ricky, uh, love his sense of humor, and uh, most importantly, love his dedication to the Word and uh, his ability to teach uh, in, in, a, in a simple way, in a way that makes it easy for all of us to understand and, and all of us to apply to our lives. I do want to make you aware of just uh, one announcement. Uh, we express our sympathy to the family of Charles Scott. Uh, Charles passed away yesterday, and his funeral and visitation, visitation will be tomorrow uh, from 1 to 2 p.m. at the Hamilton Funeral Home, uh, with the funeral being at 2 p.m. All of that will be at the funeral home. And of course, we express our sympathy uh, to uh, Rose and the rest of the family and uh, mourn for their passing. We'll now turn things over to Ricky. Hello, Hamilton Church of Christ. This is Ricky Collum. I am the preacher at Hackleburg Church of Christ. I'm excited to be able to spend this time with you tonight. I'm looking forward uh, to the time that we can meet together and, and worship together. Uh, I'm sorry that that's not available at this time, but I do uh, sincerely look forward to uh, studying tonight from John chapter five. So while you look in your Bibles, uh, I have spoken at Hamilton many times before, I'm a big Ted Burleson fan. Ted was my teacher and a very capable mentor while I struggled to get my degrees. And uh, I also like your youth minister slash uh, assistant minister slash chief cook and bottle washer. Uh, I can't never remember his name, Ryan. Uh, but... Uh, I absolutely am excited about the opportunity to talk to you from the book of John tonight. We'll be looking at chapter five. I love the book of John and the book of John loves me because he tells me time and time again that I am his little child. And anytime somebody calls me little, I'm all for it. And John is so, so uh, loving in the way that he he uh, writes and the way that he records uh, through inspiration uh, the uh, the book of John. Uh, before we get to John five, let's look at uh, and think about John three. I want you to see the commonality in John three, John four, and John five. In John three. Uh, Nicodemus comes to uh, Jesus at night and uh, uh, Jesus talks to him about the new birth, uh, about uh, how he needs to be baptized in the water and the spirit. And that theme of water goes on over into jo uh, John chapter four, where we meet the lady at the well, the well of Jacob, and Jesus teaches her about the living water. And then that same theme of water uh, carries on into John chapter 5. So let's begin our study of John chapter 5 with verse 1. After this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Uh, as you study your Bible, I would love for you to mark down the times that the Bible says that you go down to Jerusalem. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's north, south, east, or west. In all my studies, I have found that you go up to Jerusalem. Look at verse 2. Now there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water, for an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Uh, we at Hackleburg are studying from the book of Nehemiah and our studies collided on this in that we were studying the gates of Jerusalem and we got to 
understand where the sheep gate was and, and uh, know that there is a pool there, uh, Bethesda or Bethsaida, according to whether it's Hebrew or Greek, I think. Uh, but it translates house of mercy in Hebrew and in the Greek, it is a swimming bath. And in the Greek culture of that day, they believed in these pools of healing and there were many that were scattered around. And this was a common story of an angel stirring the waters, uh, uh, referring to these pools. The sick would gather around and the first one in the water, according to the legend, would be healed. And the uh, this, whether it's a, a fable or whatever, is included in the Bible. And I can tell you exactly why it's there. It's to prove that Jesus was more powerful than any thing that anyone could either imagine or uh, in reality, Jesus was better than. And so uh, let's go on and let's read the fifth verse there where it says, now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? Can you imagine to be uh, uh, have an infirmity for 38 years? Do, do you realize how long 38 years is? Me and my wife were married in 1986, and we've been married uh, 33, soon to be 34 years. And so uh, that would be 1982. Uh, 38 years was uh, a little bit better than the average lifespan of a male during the time of Jesus. And uh, it's within two years, if you remember, how long the Israelites wandered in the wilderness. So to be infirm for 38 years is a long time. And if you have trouble going back to 1982, the phrase that was going around then was phone home, uh, made famous by the movie E.T. Uh, you could have access to your brand new Commodore 64, which was the first home computer. Uh, you might be break dancing while playing Miss Pac-Man and listening to Michael Jackson's Thriller. All of this happened in 82. So 38 years is a long time, but I want you to notice something else from the scripture that we read there in that Jesus knew, Jesus knew that he already had been in that condition for that amount of time. Uh, and I want you to notice here that the man is waiting for the angel to stir the water so that he could be the first in, but his infirmity was not allowing that. Uh, Jesus did not have to stir waters. Jesus did not have to bring the man to the pool. Uh, the crowd around the pool were all waiting on the stirring of the waters for that magical power. But Jesus's power was so much greater and most would have let him walk by unnoticed. Uh, and that's another thing about Jesus. Uh, the Pharisees were uh, belittling Jesus in his ministry, and yet uh, Nicodemus was a Pharisee. So most of us uh, don't have a lot to do with the people that are against us or are our enemies. Uh, the lady at the well was a lady of ill repute. She had been married five times and was not married to the man that she was with at the present. Uh, she came more than likely to the well at that certain hour, the hottest hour of the day, to keep from being uh, uh, made fun of because of her lifestyle. And most people would not associate with someone like that. And for 38 years, people had been passing by this man at the pool. Uh, as they come through the gate, entering into the city of Jerusalem, and paying him little or no attention. But to Jesus, everyone was special and everyone is special because everyone has a soul. And I want you to notice what Jesus says to him. And this man has been 
sitting there for so long and Jesus looks at him and says, do you want to be made well? What a question. Uh, I mean, do you want to be made well? And notice that the man immediately goes somewhere else. Notice what he says there in verse seven. The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. He said, oh, are you going to help me to get down into the pool? When the first stirring comes, are you the person that is going to make me well by putting me into the stirring waters? Isn't that something? If he only knew that he was talking to the Son of God, but he didn't. And he, but this man had to have been of good character because he could not get to the pool by himself. He did not live at the pool. So therefore he had people who brought him to the pool, didn't he? But those people had to go on about their lives. They couldn't wait for the waters to stir and, and, and maybe push someone back so that they could get their friend in. And so when Jesus says, do you want to be made well? The sick man thinks, "Is are you going to put me in the waters? Well, look at verse eight. Jesus said to him, rise, take your bed and walk. Rise, take your bed and walk. A man who 38 years has never risen in his life, has never stood upright, certainly does not have the strength to lift his bed, even if it is a, a mat of some sort. Uh, he, he probably doesn't possess the strength to do that. So Jesus has walked up to him and asked him, does he want to be made well? And then tells him to rise and take his bed and walk. And here is what's so strange about that. Look at verse nine. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. Isn't this amazing? 38 years, this man has had to been toted to the, to the pool. 38 years he has waited for the waters to stir so that he might accidentally be the first one to go in. 38 years he has never stood upright. 38 years he's never been able to pick up his bed. And after he meets Jesus and Jesus asks him, does he want to be made well? Then immediately he is standing with the bed under his arm. Now, do you doubt what Jesus could do in your life? Not when you see this miracle. And that's what it was for, wasn't it? It was so that we could see the power of God on earth, of Jesus walking this earth. We could see his power. We could see that he could make the lame to walk, the blind to see. And these miracles were performed so that we would understand that he was of God, that he was the son of God. Now we didn't finish with verse nine, did we? We need to read the rest of that. And that day was the Sabbath. You know, we don't read anywhere in here where the rest of those people that were around the pool said, Jesus, heal me or, or anything like that. You know what we read about? Look at verse 10. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured. Now they understand. They walked by this man for 38 years. They understand that he was cured, but look where their mind goes. It is the Sabbath. It is not lawful for you to carry your bed. Not Oh, my friend, I've noticed for 38 years you have had this infirmity. I've noticed for 38 years you've been unable to walk. I, I've walked by you the whole time, and, and, and I know that you've, that, that you've been cured. Isn't that wonderful? No, you've broken the law. You are not to take up your bed and walk. It's unlawful. 
He said to them, he who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. A man who was unable to walk was now not only walking, but had the strength to carry his bed. This man that everyone knew to be crippled is now free from his suffering. And all the Jews can see that is that he broke the law of the Sabbath. Well, he actually didn't break the law of the Sabbath. If you want to, to be picky, and the Jews were picky, this was something that the Pharisees had added to the law of God. The healed man did not break the law of Moses concerning the Sabbath. And if you want to study this further, I'm going to give you the verses. If you want to write them down real quick, uh, Exodus 31, uh, verse 15 through 17 uh, Numbers 15, verse 32 through 36. You can also find it in the book of Nehemiah, the 13th chapter, the 15th verse, and it goes on through the 21st verse. Jeremiah 17, 21 through 23 covers the same subject. And the, the passages indicate that the work of the law of Moses prohibited was a deliberate work was an ordinary work. Now, when it says ordinary, that means something that you could have done another day. A profit-making labor on the Sabbath, which could and should have been done on other days other than the Sabbath. So the healing of the lame man did not violate any of the laws, but these rule-keeping religious leaders were not happy that the man was healed. All they saw was that he had violated not the law of God, but the tradition of the fathers. You know, I wish that I could say that we have grown past that, but I'm afraid we have not. You see that we still uh, hold on to the tradition of our fathers. I talked or heard a preacher talking not long ago, said that he preached at a church to where the man that was going to introduce him came to him and said, we're going to have two songs and a prayer and then two songs and then you'll speak. And this is the same way that we've been doing it for 66 years. Well, that's all well and good, but that's not binding, is it? If somebody wanted to lead just one song, maybe all four verses of one song, would that be wrong? See, we nitpick small things like this and we lose the salvation of Christ. Tom Holland, a great man of God and one of the best speakers I ever heard, said that it seemed to him that he spent more time trying to explain where Adam and Eve's sons got their wives than the plan of salvation. It seems like that as Christians, we spend too much time looking for the bad instead of seeing the good. And does that make us any different than the Jews of that day? Look at the focus of the Jews. Look at verse 12. Then they ask him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? They didn't ask him this to know who Jesus was. That If, it, if they did, this would have been the greatest part of, of the entire scripture. But they said this to see whom they could prosecute. Look at verse 13. But the one who was healed did not know who it was. For Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. There were so many people that, that Jesus just might have stepped back into the crowd or it might have been some miraculous things. But do you see here that instead of seeing the miracle, they just saw the violation of the law. They looked for the bad and not for the good. They wanted to punish the person who had violated the rules that had been set down by their fathers. But I want you to notice the focus of Jesus. Even though he might have stepped back or even though it may have been a miracle that he, he went away, but notice his focus. Verse 14, afterwards, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, 
See, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest a worse thing come upon you. Think about that. A worse thing come upon you than 38 years an invalid? Yes. Eternal destruction. Sin no more. You see, Jesus was more worried about the spiritual than the physical. Jesus wanted this man to see that this was of God. Isn't that what the miracles were for? You remember we talked about it earlier that they were there so that we would know that this teaching and preaching was of God. They were signs and wonders to show the that God, that this person was speaking uh, through God's approval. Verse 15 said, the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who made him well. Jesus Christ was more concerned with the spiritual than the physical. And I want you to see where that led. I want you to see how entranced these people were, how entrenched they were in their beliefs in that, read verse 16. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. Because he had done these things on the Sabbath. Can you believe that? They eventually kill the Son of God. They eventually get what they wanted here. They missed the miracle they missed the Son of God walking on the earth because they were wanting to keep the tradition of their fathers. Do you see that sometimes in churches today? Most of you aren't as old as I am. But in my 60 years of walking this earth, I've seen a lot of things. And I can remember as a child, we worshiped at the Stewardsville Church of Christ going toward uh, uh, Savannah, Tennessee on Savannah Highway right outside of Florence. And I can remember before there was air conditioning, they raised the windows on hot days like we've been having lately. And there was a piece of cheesecloth that went over the Lord's Supper and, uh, to keep the flies from getting into the fruit of the vine and, and the unleavened bread uh, to keep those out, they had a piece of cheesecloth there. And it was a, a very ceremonious type thing that the people that were doing the Lord's Supper performed in that they would fold that cloth in a manner that would be the same honor that we would give the flag of the United States at the death of a veteran. It was, it was really, uh, it was really quite a performance of how they would fold that piece of cheesecloth, and they would uh, uh, fold it in that certain way, and then they would place it underneath the table, and. I can remember when they got central heat and air conditioning at that church that the elders had decided that they no longer needed the cheesecloth to keep the, the flies out of the Lord's Supper, so they did away with it. And I can remember one older gentleman came and told him, he said, you have destroyed the shroud of Christ. That had been over his body this whole time. And now you have destroyed it. Well, I mean, that's, that's a good thought. I mean, and we do need to think, don't we, that when we partake of the Lord's Supper, that we need to think of the burial of Christ Jesus Christ, but we also need to think of the resurrection, don't we? Because without the resurrection, the burial is just that, a burial. And so 
while we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we should not let tradition stand in the way. We should do it the way that it was done in the first century church and the way that Jesus handed it down. And even though that man, it hurt his feelings it, it, because he had seen his father fold that. And when he got old enough, he was one of the ones that folded it and he had seen his son fold it and, and it had become a part of his worship. But I don't believe that old man would have killed Jesus over it. But I believe the Jews would. I know that they would. For this reason, the Jews persecuted Jesus and sought to kill him because he had done these things on the Sabbath. He had healed a man that had been an invalid for 38 years, but he did it on the Sabbath. If he'd have done it any other day, wouldn't it have been wonderful? No there would have been something else. But I want you to notice what Jesus says here. And I want you to think about this. The Lord rested on the seventh day and, and, and he says in the, in the Old Testament that, that we should too, that that should be a day that we are uh, dedicating to uh, our service to God. And, and, and I have no problem with that, even though in the the New Testament, we know that we're supposed to meet on the first day of the week and, and everything like that. But it doesn't mean that God rested the rest of the time, does it? Because notice what Jesus says, verse 17. Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now. Until this day, my father has been working. Yes, he rested, but he didn't rest forever. And Jesus says, and I have been working. What are we to do as Christians? Well, we're to, we're to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. We're to be the, 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 the mouthpiece. We're to speak the gospel. We're to seek and save the lost. And we should be about that, shouldn't we? Some of us act like that every day is the Sabbath and we choose not to, to do what God wants us to do, that we're not servants. It's like he is our servant. We come to church and we sit in our seat and we say, what have you got for us today, God? But do you see that God is continually working and Jesus was continually working and his followers need to be continually working? I hope that everything that you do is because you are a servant of God and that you are serving him and that we are working together to make his kingdom greater. And I hope that everything that we do is for the glory of God. And I hope that this message falls on your heart and helps you in your daily journey as a Christian. Because being a Christian is a journey. It's not a destination. We will never say, oh, well, I'm finally there until we are in heaven above. We do not get to retire from Christianity. We should be about our father's business. Thank you for listening. I hope that this has helped.